My name is Natasha from UNYC UKM, and I'm so happy to see everyone here today, even though we only have around 48 participants, it's okay. We're gonna have uh, more later. <laughs> okay, uh, so for those of you who just joined us, I would like to say welcome. Uh, here are some reminders of today's event. Please ensure to stay muted throughout the whole webinar to avoid any interruptions. And uh, please be reminded that this event will be recorded. Okay, now without wasting any time, I shall start by introducing what is the event today is all about and the purpose of today's event. So the objectives of today's event is to address and discuss critically the issues of violence directed to women and girls, as well as to highlight the Sustainable Development Goals or SDG in the United Nations, which uh, is specifically goal number 5.2, eliminating violence against women and girls. So this webinar also aims to spread awareness among students regarding the worrying aspect of violence and ways to protect and prevent any forms of violence towards women. So we also, uh, we also hope to empower participants who were victims of violence acts previously uh, through the engagement by our inspirational speakers during the sessions. So as you can see from the title of tonight's event, the theme of this event is eliminating violence against women and girls. Now, I shall start introduce to everyone our speakers for tonight's event. So today we are joined by two amazing and empowering women as our speakers. First up, it is our greatest pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the first session, Dr. Saidatul Nadia Abdul Aziz. So Dr. Nadia is also a senior lecturer of the Faculty of Law UKM. She is an expert and specializes in international law and ASEAN integration. I'm sure she has a lot of uh, a lot to share with us regarding today's topic. So Dr. Nadia, maybe you can say a little greetings to our participants today who are very excited for your upcoming session. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, I should say thank you for joining the, the, the session, though it's a Saturday night, though you yeah. cannot do anyway. Uh, anyway, anyway. So, because PKB, guys, more on the road than the Amla Roma. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your. Uh, orang kata speaker tetap for you NYC ni everyone everything also Dr Nadia <laughs> Dr Nadia but it's okay I'll try my best I'll just uh, just a brief uh, note lah um, I'm not gonna give you guys a lecture tonight don't worry I will not give you slides for you to memorize and there's nothing to do with your exams or so on <laughs> so I will just yeah, it's just some insights and eh? I just share some insights, perhaps uh, uh, things that um, I actually welcome any feedback. It, it would be so great if I have any feedback. Uh, I, I welcome, I even in my class also, I always open the floor to anyone who wants to speak. Uh, normally the student lah, doesn't want to speak. Eh? Bila faham, 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 <laughs> I don't want to speak. But anyways, thank you for inviting me. I will um, try my best uh, to, to give some um, um, interesting insights lah, perhaps eh, you want to share perhaps it's a, because it's about women so it's very yes. close to art so um, tapi men pun boleh dengar because it's actually of course yes it can sebab um, sometimes uh, the violence might uh, uh, caused by men sometimes might not okay so so we can actually look both both ways lah okay sometimes the victim walaupun kita cakap woman kadang-kadang violence pun boleh happen to men so you know he a little bit here and there i can just share no problem uh, i hope i can help lah okay thank okay. you Thank you, Dr. Nadia, for the greetings and a little introduction. So uh, next, I'm sure everyone is as equally excited for our second speaker. She is the founder and president of a non-profit organization called Sukarelawan Society. She's also active in voicing out issues to uh, regarding violence directed to women through her social media platforms. And she's also involved in many talks regarding women empowerment, uh, mental health, self-love, and many more. So now let's give it up to Miss Sherry Amin. 
So, Miss Sherry, maybe you can say a little greetings yeah, to our participants today. Hey. Hi. Give me another bus. Yeah, no one told me I had to do like an introductory speech, but hello. <laughs> um, this is actually, I think, the fourth or third talk I've ever done. So, mind you, I'm not as decorated as our previous speaker. Speaker like Dr. Nadia probably will share you more like professional input, whereas I think I'm gonna be a bit more like. I guess uh, personal, a little bit more immature, but hopefully you guys can learn something today and you know, we can all have an open conversation today. Yes, thank you so much for the lovely greetings from both speakers. Now, uh, now that we all have like uh, gotten a little sneak peek of our speakers for today, I shall not waste any time. We shall first start with our first session. Uh, before that, I would like to give a little reminder to the participants uh, that you will have the opportunity to submit your text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the chat box. So you may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of each session. So now, Dr. Nadia will be sharing with us insights on the issues pertaining to violence against women and girls, and you know, a little, a little like legal perspective maybe on this issue maybe which is like vital for us to actually understand so the floor is yours Dr. Nadia. Okay so uh, again I will not be sharing any slides so you will actually see my face throughout the session okay please admire me and <laughs> appreciate my uh, my appearance today okay okay just kidding okay uh, let me just um, I always say that I will talk less normally I will just talk and talk and talk and then stop talking eh? and all my students will know that um I will just uh, break my session into uh, two parts. Okay, the first part I will just briefly eh, um, uh, talk about the uh, legal perspective, especially the international uh, mechanism. Eh? International, what what do we really have uh, in the international um, uh, under the purview of international law? Um, uh, focusing on violence against women. Okay, okay, we know that eh, the issue of when when I actually look at your your topic and eh, the issue that you are trying to bring, violence against women is nothing new. It's not a new issue. It has been all along the way i mean like from if you if you ask your mother eh, yeah it's been there if you ask your grandmother also yeah it's been there okay but but um the the uh, i mean the the way that the violence actually emerged it, uh, it 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 differs throughout time i think our next speaker will actually be much more uh, relevant to talk about this eh? but perhaps i will just share a little bit of my knowledge okay um Okay, for under the purview of international law, we know that, that we do have some international mechanism, something uh, like international um, declaration of human rights, because violence against women is something that um, it violates a human rights, okay? Whatever protection that a, a woman or a girl should actually have, eh, talking about, about a person, a person, okay, not just women and girls, a protection against violence is actually very vital. Okay, it's a it's it's a very it's a very basic human rights. Everyone should have that. Okay, but if it's being violated, then that that comes the 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 situation that needs to be to be discussed. Okay, let me just uh just point out a few um declarations and conventions that that uh that is um relevant to this topic. Okay. The first one is Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We, I think most of you knows that, okay? Everyone is actually aware of it, okay? Uh, we, which, which we, uh, here we discuss almost all about human rights. When when we talk about human rights, everyone also, yes, human rights, doctor. go to toilet, also human rights, okay? Everything also human rights. But perhaps the uh, the concept of human rights is very, very um, um, sensitive. Eh? I, I might say it's very sensitive and it's very uh, back to a nation, uh, a nation's practice, sensitivity, okay? We have the sensitivity, we have all this religion, sensitivity, we have all this, um, apa? race religion so human rights and eh, when 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 it when it applies uh, to a certain state it might be different okay what you have in us might not have in uh, malaysia because the application is totally different okay that's why when they have lgbt there you cannot go la apa go take off your shirt uh, in the middle of the apa, rally uh, at the street and say we want lgbt then we don't know so lgbt too so what okay so that's the, that's just an overview la, saying that the application of human rights um uh, of among all states around the world is different but when you talk about violence 
it's practically um, the most discussed issue throughout the whole uh, country of the world. Okay, violence against women. It has been a discussion, thorough discussion up until they actually make a convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women or we call it CEDAW. Okay, CEDAW is the one I think most of you also know that lah. Also, everyone also be the pandai, right? So everyone also know, okay, CEDAW. So this is uh, practically focusing on women. Okay, we, we actually see that. And then we have another one, UN is so baik hati, then go UN declaration on the apa, elimination violence against women. The woman. And then we see like the um, our friend Natasha actually mentioned SDG also actually mentioned on um, um, apa, eliminating violence against, uh, against women can so we actually see that everyone is aware of it actually aware of the fact that women is being uh, the, the violence against women is nothing new. It's an issue that we'll be carrying throughout our lives. Because you know why? Um, we have all this international um, uh, mechanism. Eh? We have all the international mechanism. Very terror. Lah. We, see, we see when it comes to law, kan? Oh, we cannot, cannot uh, dispute. Uh, memang terror. Eh? When it comes to too late, uh, the, uh, the, the wordings of the law, if you read one by one, very beautiful. It's like, like, okay, you are Mother Teresa, ah, something like that. You are the, the, apa, orang kata memang syurga di bawah tapak kaki ibu lah, something like that lah. So, woman memang tinggi lah, so very high. But, the sad thing is, when it comes to application, application, it becomes a customary international law. Customary international law ni, it means that you are obliged to apply to your country. Okay, dia memang dah jadi custom. So, semua country kena practice benda ni. But the sad thing is, bila datang dekat country, when it comes to our our country, eh, uh, uh, I mean, uh, different state lah. When it comes back to your state, ada sign and all, and then uh, and then you you come to application of the state, that starts the problem. Okay, now, I'm not gonna, um, I'm gonna be mad lah because people are not, uh, you know, um, um, applying all these principles, uh, sign convention, declaration, whatsoever, lah, treaties, whatsoever, and then come back to your home, alah, put aside lah, something like that. It, it, that is very normal. I'm not going to comment on that. But the fact that this issue is not face, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't have any solution just yet. Okay. First of all, Zaman datuk nenek kita pun dah ada this issue. Eh? I I told you before. Okay, then we they come uh, internationally. Uh, internationally, they they make all this convention declaration and all. Okay, that's a good sign, right? That's a good sign. Okay, then we have uh, CRC for girls. Okay, but please, uh, I just want to tell you guys, um, the sharing, sharing, uh, sharing to you guys that I think by now violence does not mean abuse physically only okay i always i i if you if if i actually read the line of eh, violence against women my head was just think about oh the you know domestic violence you know people girls uh, sorry women uh, being beaten by their husbands or boyfriends or whatsoever okay that's not just about it violence because now we are living in a world that is no boundary it has no boundary, okay? It's it's not just about domestic violence anymore. It's not just about physically uh, abusing anymore, okay? You can be violated by um, uh, physically, mentally, psychologically, okay? There's, uh, there's this... Um, uh, I... Um, Despite this many legal, uh, ob, uh, ob, oh, sorry, legal mechanism, policy, measures, whatsoever, it's not only just to tackle the, I might say, the, um, the old school <laughs> or the old type of violence. Because I might, I, okay, I'll just give you one example of new type of, of violence against women. It's like uh, sub, cyber violence, cyber stalking. Stalking is violence okay and then all these comments okay i personally okay personally bukanlah i ni macam apa macam 
bangga popular ke apa tu <laughs> okay but I have been experiencing it okay the ones who has actually been following me through Instagram uh, before this because I actually deactivated my my uh, account the one who has been following me might saw might might actually seen uh, me posting one video because there's Uh, guys and eh, guys uh, i i don't want to mention who lah okay guys uh, maybe perhaps uh, he he or he thinks that he knows me okay from somewhere okay and then when he added me up uh, in in facebook um he thought he wanted to try lah then punching lah kan try okay but i was clearly putting my daughter's picture there i thought as a security lah for people not to uh, kacau me kan <laughs> but that is totally not the case here um this is not just me eh? a lot of my friends actually been sharing this but i'm just going i'm just i i just want to share the 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 emerging issues that is contributing actually to to violence against women okay it's like this eh he started to text me okay assalamualaikum biasalah kan assalamualaikum okay saying me kan nak kan tudung semua kan assalamualaikum so i want okay lah um um normally i would just ignore that if it's just assalamualaikum like that i would just like ah oh, malas lah layan okay and then if it's like assalamualaikum doktor then i was like okay perhaps Kadang-kadang I tak kenal pun tahu who is he was apa ni kan. Kadang-kadang maybe it's a student yang I memang tak kenal or something. Ex-student I forgot ke whatsoever. So I just say Waalaikumsalam. Okay. The first guy, uh, this one ada two ke three guys lah. I was just, I was just uh, keep it short to two lah. The first guy actually say Assalamualaikum doctor. Uh, and then he said, um, lecturer FUU ke? And then I say, uh, yes. Um, dah lama ke jadi lecturer? So I said, Okay, this is something um, you know leading to somewhere else. And then I said, um, yes, uh, around three years like that, uh, joining FU. But before that, I was with FU anyway. And then, but she, and then he said like, oh, um, uh, umur berapa? Something like that, tau. I said, okay, dia ni bukan student aku. <laughs> so, something like, no, he's nothing. And then I, I was, I, I don't, uh, I, I. Uh, I screenshot the 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 conversation. I look at the friends in common. Most of the friends in common is actually um, my ex student. So I sent out um, a text message to him uh, with a screenshot message saying that, okay, can I know who is this? Uh, is this you one of your friends? Or maybe I you know like something I terlupa. Uh, he said no, doctor. You don't know him. Uh, he's no one. I said okay, fine. Then I stop there. Okay, this person stop when I stop because I actually block him. Okay, the other person, he was a friend of mine uh, during school. Okay, um, when he started the conversation, um, I did not respond. Okay, because I was so tired and I was so busy. Eh? Bet tengok uh, banyak lagi kerja lelo lah, apa lah nak tengok kan? <laughs> okay, so when he started message texting me, I did not reply. He texted me again in the same day, almost seven times. Okay, assalamualaikum, assalamualaikum. Nak kenal boleh ke? Nak jawab lah. Kenapa tak jawab? Something like that, tau. It's very, very disturbing. Okay, I, I was so furious, and then I actually replied. Uh, it's up until night time. It's like around 11 o'clock like that. It started around around morning, 8 o'clock something like that. Until 11 o'clock, the same day. And then I said, um, I I actually um, I menyamar lah jadi my husband kan. I said I said hello bro, uh, why why are you texting someone's wife? I said, and then he said, oh, uh, someone's wife ke? Something like that. Oh tak tahu. Something like he is not even you know like rasa bersalah or anything. He's he's not. He's keep on saying that what he's doing is actually right. He said, oh kalau tahu uh, wife orang tak kacau. Um, sorry ah, something like that. You know, like something he doesn't feel like it's wrong. Okay, that's what happening to me lah. One of it. Okay, some of my friends are very, I think. Okay, some of us are very unfortunate to have. Uh, perhaps they know that that person is a uh, single mother or something, and eh? being divorced or something. Eh? That is one issue that perhaps not now lah for you guys, but perhaps later. Eh? This is an issue that I'm I'm focusing on cyber violence. Eh? 
they keep on texting, texting, texting up to the extent that they are sharing nude uh, photos. That is very sickening. Eh? Sickening for me. I don't want to talk about this normal type of violence because I think that type of violence until today, it's happening and the world is, they know, but uh, throughout all types of legal mechanism that I have mentioned, it is still not settled. But now it's emerging a new one, a new type of um, violence. Okay, cyber bullying or cyber violence is not uh, just for women. Eh? It's it's just it's again it, it applies to men also. But women is so vulnerable when they okay. Let me just throw out something to you. Eh? You all have social media, right? Okay, when you post out some pictures, okay, post a picture. I think like oh, cantiknya aku kan post. Okay. It post and then and then suddenly suddenly you 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 receive a comment, yeah comment saying that. Kenapa hidung you besar, or why is your ear is like an elephant something like that? That is actually one type of violence. Yeah, I can say that, but what do you do? What do you do? You will go check back yourself at the mirror. Is it true? You go check back yourself at the mirror or if you post some very nice clothes you are wearing and then someone will start to just give a comment saying that it's a senior. What would you do? You go go check the picture again saying that eh, sexy ke? Kat mana sexy? Zoom, zoom, zoom lagi. Tengok sexy mana sexy. But women are like that. Because women, they tend to blame themselves tau. They tend to, to say that it's me. It's because of me. So that's why when it comes to international mechanism pun, we can give so many, so many in the whole wide world we can give. Okay, we can we can even give new conventions or declarations eh? until like, okay lah, millennium or, or like Dr. Nadia said lah, cyber violence for women. Violence for women. Eh? Cyber violence for women, uh, a declaration by UN. We can do that. But still, the access to justice, now that's an issue. Okay. Some cases, women are the one who don't want to actually go in front because they are very, they are very intimidated. Okay. They feel scared. They feel they are, they are ashamed. Okay. That's when the violence starts. Because, I, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to put this in a formal way, but we have to admit it's a man's world. Okay. Me, when, when I go out, um, being a lawyer after I graduated, like just like you guys, uh, after I graduated law school, I, I was a lawyer. When I go out as a lawyer, it's a whole new world for me. Okay. I was not, I don't even know how to handle the world because it's too wild. Because it's it's a man's world. When you go to a law firm and I was, uh, masa tu tak insaf, tak, tak, <laughs> tak pakai tudung lagi. But, you know, I was young. So whatever, it's your choice, whatever. Okay. But they look at me at a different perspective. So, violence is actually a discrimination. Remember that. Okay. When I uh, started to practice and then there's this law firm, eh, um, when I when I go to interview and they actually say um, this law firm only allows girls with short skirts. I don't wear short skirts though I don't I don't wear, wear the hijab. I don't wear short skirts. So they say uh, if they wear if they wear short if you don't wear short skirts then you are not welcome here. That is one type of discrimination. Okay why why what what's the difference if I wear a long skirt and then a short skirt what's the difference? Right? Is it the day I wear short skirt, you see my legs. The day I wear long skirt, you don't see my legs. That's all right. That's for me. That's for us. But it's the it's a man's world. It's totally different. So that actually, that's the start of a violence. That's a start. We don't realize that. We don't even see it that way because we see that it's normal, lah. Normal like that. Okay. When when a, when a wife is uh is not um. Obeying the husband's uh, um, instruction, for example, putting aside um, the religions, punya ni, eh? I'm putting aside that. Eh? But if it's something that is is very basic, but the wife doesn't have her right at all, that's the basic of a violence. Okay, but 
People don't realise that. People don't see that. Because they say, eh, wife kan? Dengarlah cakap husband. Something like that. Okay? What? Why am I saying this? Why am I giving you example? Because these are all the consequences that is contributing to why our international mechanism is not working. Because access to justice is actually not there. I mean, okay, our next speaker, I think I I, I am at delighted to hear her stories eh, because NGOs, you know, they have many, I love talking to NGOs, eh, especially when I do research, eh, they are giving me live feedbacks, I love that, okay, I will always use their feedbacks in my papers, okay, in my research papers, eh. okay, so if you see from the real cases, the beginning of a woman being so scared to even get an access eh, to justice, that's the point when why this legal uh, international legal mechanism isn't working at all oh, no i can see i can see at all uh, because okay sdgs eh, when uh, i just want to mention a little bit what for sdgs uh, because um i have i'm teaching a uh, master student international development law okay they uh, i think undergrads that did uh, don't really have this opportunity to hear uh, of the, about this okay sdgs eh we have these SDGs until 2030. The first one is and hunger, eh? eliminating hunger eh? and hunger. And then they have all this justice here and there, everywhere, lah, until 17, the water, until also. And then why there's one um, goal, it's for women. Because it's a never-ending issue. Same thing like hunger. Hunger, poverty, it's never ending issue. How can you end end hunger? Okay, I just say lah, duduk rumah pun tak berhabis lapar doktor. Bukanlah, you orang yang tak makan. So, end hunger for people yang tak ada access to food. Okay, you guys dah berlambat-lambat food dah. Okay, so why woman is in SDGs? Have you ever think why? Okay, even our own labor laws eh, for domestic workers also are not covered. Okay. You are not allowed, um, apa? Uh, you are not considered as a worker, okay? Migrant worker tu even, even is another issue lah for women. Vulnerable dia memang tahap memang I, I cannot even imagine lah, okay? But just um, just to to give you an overview of what is happening, okay? We, um, we have that mechanism. We have that... Um, um, uh, how do I say international legal mechanism of um, violation for violation eh, in particular for violation against women is there okay in fact it's in ICCPR it's in uh, so many uh, conventions uh, all over eh, because uh, there are so many member states are say uh, signing but the application of it I tell you eh Five, th five more years after this talk, eh? this is 2020, uh, 2025, I, I, I can actually say that this issue will not settle. Okay? How, eh? How do we overcome the fear? It's back to ourselves. Okay? I don't want to potong lah nanti. I think this, the next speaker will actually give more interesting insight. Eh? This one is very academic lah. Hobby kan very boring lah Dr. Nadia ni lagi. <laughs> okay. So how do we do it? It's actually back to ourselves. For me lah, for me. Okay. We can have all the laws in the world. Eh? I tell you. We can have all... Uh, being in the field eh, for 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 quite some time. Eh, for In the international, um, in international law field. Um, sometimes it's frustrating to see how beautiful the words are in the uh, uh, in the laws, eh? but there are so little um, application. But the, the the saddest thing is because it's from the from the side of the woman. Okay, we are not talking about just. Uh, domestic violence eh? Sebab no, no, violence is not domestic violence lah. Don't apa lagi violence boleh jadi No, I have laid down to you All types of violence All types of new violence That maybe we don't even know We don't even realise it I, I think maybe Eh betul lah I ni hari-hari kena kacau so, Many people actually texted me After I posted the video of awareness Tu konon-konon kan Insta famous aku Konon-konon <laughs> Many people texted me saying that thank you doctor, it's actually happening to me. I pun dah rimas sangat, tapi I don't know what to do. 
Bila I tak reply, they say sombongnya. Uh, bila I tak reply, so what kalau I sombong? Faham tak? Faham tak? You 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 get what I mean kan? Women are being um, targeted eh. Targeted and then being pandang so low tau. So, to get yourself up and to to get, I know it's hard. Uh, I know because uh, uh, there are some cases eh. There are some cases um, when you talk about violence ni, it affects you the It affects your life. Eh, affects your life. You cannot say that, Alah, kena pukul je kan? Pukul lah balik. <laughs> you cannot say that. It's nothing like that. Because everyone is facing a different uh, type of violence themselves yang tahu. And how they handle it on themselves only. What more, lagi teruk if they are keeping them keeping it to themselves. So we cannot help. So, I think uh, I will stop here. Uh, I nak dengar sebenarnya, kasih kas, lah dengar. I pula dengar orang cakap kan, si I je cakap. <laughs> kasih lah, I pula dengar uh, apa kita punya speaker ni cakap. Uh, so, I I will end here to for, just for, you know, I suka kan throw things to ponder kan. So, I I will just throw things to ponder. Lepas ni mana tahu kan, macam kata, eh betul lah, kurik-kurik balik inbox. Eh betul lah, I ni kena violent ni. Ah, ni ni violence kat diri I sebenarnya. So, I hope that... Um, There's some kind of awareness that I can throw. Okay, I really appreciate lah if if uh, this uh, UNYC could um, help it. it. It you are actually opening up the floor. Okay, uh, perhaps if anyone wants to share after this in the chat, eh, I welcome. I I memang lagi suka lah dengar. I suka dengar cerita ni kan bergosip kan? Biasa lah masuk orang dengar kan? Okay, Natasha, back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Doctor, for the insightful session. So, I guess um, I'm pretty sure everyone has expanded their understanding on the issues of violence against women and girls. Dr. Nadia has mentioned in detail about the, you know, the international legal instruments and uh, the emergence of new form of violences. So, I guess everyone is aware now. Uh, so now I would like to see the chat box in case if anyone has asked a few questions. Okay, no questions. So, so is there anyone would like to ask any questions? Come on, come on, guys. You can type in your question in the chat box. Anyone would like to share anything? No. <laughs> Okay, so I guess everyone is very clear on what Dr. Nadia has shared with us earlier. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadia. I think, you know, I was jotting down a lot of things just now. International, okay, oh, oh, uh, SDGs, whatever, everything. Because um, I'm a law student myself, so <laughs> I'm jotting down a lot of stuff. For my, probably it's useful for, you know, project paper, you know, your final final year project, whatever. So, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nadia. That was so interesting. Uh, and now let's move on to the second session. So the second session, we are going to be focusing more on uh, the factors that may drive the acts of violence directed upon women. Why do some people think that women are easily targeted and in what situation can women be seen as vulnerable? And lastly, how can the victims seek help and how do we help to support the victims? So I'm very sure everyone's excited to listen what Miss Sherry has to share with us. So Miss Sherry, the, spot, the spotlight is yours. Right, I have like one question. Am I supposed to share the slides myself? Because I actually don't know how to do that. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, okay. I think we can share it now. Uh, the IT team, can, okay. can anyone share? Okay. Is it sharing? Not yet. Okay. okay, it's okay. I think I'll try to share it. Uh, hold on. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties.
Okay, so basically uh, the technical team couldn't share the slide, but it's okay. I'll try to share it with everyone. Uh, Scroll it one by one. It's okay. I think I can do it. Um, Natasha, I already shared the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So, Miss Sherry, the spotlight is yours. All right. Okay, so, I guess suddenly I'm nervous. I don't know why, but we're going to be talking about violence against women, clearly. Um, I think the best way to start this is by introducing myself. Next slide. Okay. So, hello, my name is Sherry. Um, if you guys don't know me, most people know me from social media. Um, I'm 23 years old. I am the founder and president of Sukarela One Society, which is a nonprofit. It is a volunteering society that is youth led and we just started this summer. So unfortunately, I don't have that many real life uh, cases that I can share, but it, funny enough, it was actually one of our first projects that we wanted to per pursue was with a woman's shelter, but there was a lot of red tape because of how sensitive uh, each case is, so I couldn't really pursue it. But So I'm happy I get to do this now. I'm also the founder of a clothing brand, which also started this summer. And I'm currently in my third and final year of university, so I know how you guys feel with the Zoom calls. It's not fun. It feels weird, but... We're still here. We're still kicking. We're still kicking about. And um, I'm in Royal Holloway, uh, and I'm doing my BA in politics and international relations. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I'm just gonna go lightly. I'm gonna be talking about the conversations surrounding domestic violence, especially within the Malaysian community, because I'm not sure about you, but before anything, I was not at all educated on domestic violence. I did not know what it looked like beyond what I saw in the movies, what I saw on the TV shows. And I was also like relatively sheltered. I had really strict parents. My parents did not think this would ever happen to me. So I think I'm just like, I was just like everyone else here who's watching possibly, you know, you think that, you know, this would never happen to me. Uh, I would never let anyone treat me that way, but I mean, clearly I was wrong. Uh, and in Malaysian community, from what I've experienced, the conversation is a bit different here than what goes on in the international community. In Because I've like lived abroad, I grew up uh, uh, around a lot of cultures. And the thing that I noticed is that when it comes to talking about violence, it's not tolerated at all. It is considered a crime. It is considered disgusting. And people are angry about it. Whereas when I hear about violence in Malaysia, it is very, very much tolerated. You hear all the time, I'm sorry, I'm gonna speak a bit of Malay, but you hear it once in a while, like, you know, it's harumatanga, you cannot interfere, you cannot intervene, it is, it is between them. Or we hear that you cannot buka ayat, it is, it's, it's wrong for us to expose someone else's mistakes. And even within the youth, regardless of within Malaysia or not, when we hear about it, it's, it's, it's already like very normal and, especially with the spilling tea culture, you hear girls talk about other girls' relationship and you go, oh, I heard her boyfriend hits her. Or, or I heard their relationship is so toxic. He, he doesn't let her do this. He doesn't let her do that. And it's become a passing remark. We, we have greatly undermined. And I think it's also because we've become very desensitized to violence because we hear it very often and we get told it's not a big deal. So we undermine the severity of violence here because we're so used to it. And we don't react as, inten as intensely as the act actually is. But like I said, a lot of times it's because we weren't educated enough and I wasn't educated enough. I think most of us aren't. And I definitely think the reason why our culture has propagated and enabled abuse and violence so much is because of the lack of awareness and education. So onto the next slide. What does violence really, really look like? Okay, so here are the types of violence. It's physical abuse, psychological abuse, verbal, and sexual. And with physical abuse, it's the most obvious. It's the one that we talk about the most because it's the most evident. You can see evidence if you're lucky. Sometimes there's no evidence, but with, with my own experience from what I have to say, the worst type of abuse, just like the doctor said before, it isn't physical abuse because physical abuse, you heal. Physical abuse, you can 
mend your bones, you can heal your wounds, but psychologically, you'll never, you'll never let it, I wouldn't say like for the rest of your life, but it lives with you. The trauma does live with you. And it's so insidious that you don't even realize it's happening. And when you see someone being physically abused, you can tell what well, she's getting hurt. But then when you see someone who's being psychologically abused, you won't be able to tell. And when someone does share it with other people, how bad or intense it is, a lot of times people downplay it or don't take it seriously because there's no proof of the abuse happening. Verbal abuse is, I would say, very common in a lot of relationships from what I've seen, especially in um, local communities. I think men in Malaysia have, it's definitely been enabled by our culture. It's definitely been enabled, enabled by a community that, that women are subordinates to men. We are the property of men. So we have to listen to men. So in relationships here, um, I don't know about you guys, but I love my Malay men. I, I've only dated Malay men. And from my experience, they definitely, they definitely, um, how do I say, it? it has influenced the way they treat you in a relationship. So uh, they expect you to listen to them. You know, I don't know if it's common in, in your relationships, but from what I've seen, especially within my own group of friends, within myself, it's a very common mindset where they view women as their property. You know, everything can control and everything you have to ask them for permission. And it seems normal to us, but it's actually not. The relationship always has to be him first and then me later. And sometimes it's okay because most of the time, if you're lucky, you don't fight lucky and by eight, they will juggle you. You know, they will sigh on you really well. And you feel like it's fine. Okay. He's good to me. It's fine. I can, I can just, I can tell him first and I'll ask him for permission first. And then, you know, I'll deal with it because he's good to me. But sometimes you don't get very lucky. And most of the time, it is a form of entitlement towards you, your life, your body, and your choices. And that little wheel over there that is the power and control wheel, it actually explains how the many ways people do exert their power and in the, the different acts that they do. Um, if you have ever dealt with physical violence or domestic violence, or even if you research it, you're going to come across this wheel very much. The amount of times I have seen this wheel in the last like two years, it is actually sickening, but it has helped me tremendously to understand how these acts are actually fo a form of power and control. And the reason why I listed, I wrote down power and control there is because ultimately that is the root cause of any form of violence or any form of dominance is because they want power and control. And no guy is gonna outwardly tell you like, I want to be in control, I want dominance, but they do. It's in the small arguments you have. It's in the small instructions they give you. It's them telling you, okay, you cannot wear clothes like that. You cannot go out late at night. You cannot be friends with this person. You have to do it this way. You have to do it that way. It's because they're exerting what they want you to be in their life. They want to be the architect of not just their life, but your life too, because they are in control of you. So you don't realize it because it's quite cynical. I think it's very normal for us young teenagers to be just in love. And to just think like, okay, he's controlling me because he loves me, because he wants the best for me. But even my dad doesn't tell me what to do. You know, if anything, you're supposed to be, allowed, you're allowed to have all your options open. But when you start limiting those options for another person, they already have power and control over you. Okay, next one. So to make this make sense, I have come to the part where we talk about how I know so much and why I know so much. And a huge part in raising awareness I had to come forward with my own experience. And this is like probably the third or fourth talk I've had about domestic violence. And I'll tell you guys a secret. I actually hate this part. This part, I never look forward to it. It is so uncomfortable. And I don't enjoy sharing like, you know, the trauma, but I understand that this cause is beyond me. It is beyond my own ego. And although coming forward did bring a tale of, uh, you know, gossiping and, and the, the, the spilling tea culture and trending on Twitter. I didn't enjoy it. I did not intend on it going as viral as it did. I didn't intend on people finding out who I was talking about. And uh, as much as people would like to think this is an act of revenge, trust me, it is even worse talking about it. It is so much better keeping quiet about it. But um, like I said, this cause is bigger than me. And that's why I'm going to tell you guys what happened to me. So anyways, um, all right, so let's get started. Let's go from the beginning. I was 19 years old. I always get confused because I keep thinking I was 18, but I was 18 turning 19 when I met this guy. And 
I have never had a relationship. Most people don't believe me, but I never dated anybody uh, because the kind of person that I was growing up, relationships were not important to me. I was very determined to finish college, get my degree, get a job, you know, become a woman of my own worth and then find someone, you know, I just think that there are so many men out there for me to be stressing out about it, you know, let my, might as well make myself someone special and then I'll get someone special. And suddenly I met this guy and he was just very interesting. He was very intriguing to me because he was very different. Okay. I know that's cliche, but that is what I felt like. I felt like he was very different because most of my friends, um, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up within a very small social circle. Either I know you or I know, know you or I know of you. And like m people that were in my life, I've already known for quite a while. And this guy, when he showed up, he was so random. I've never heard of him. He came out of nowhere, but I could tell we grew up very differently. And from the beginning, I knew that our background was different. Our experiences were different. And because of that, I thought he was very mysterious, you know? Uh, a little bit broken but as girls we love a challenge so that's what happened he was honestly he was my best friend for a while like a couple months I think no it was like a couple weeks maybe a month it was very fast uh, but he was so charming and seriously so funny I know we all think abusers are like this really mean senile people but actually they're the most charming people you'll ever meet they're actually very nice people to be around they're very friendly they're outgoing they get along with everybody and when I was friends with him, he made me very, very happy. And back then I would never ever believe he had a single bone in his body that would hurt me. So when things became romantic, I fell very hard and very quick. And um, it was, I don't know, I always explain it to people like it was a movie. It happened really fast. You know, you meet this guy, he sweeps you off your feet. And I just was attached to him. We were always together all the time. And okay, like six, seven months into the relationship, that is eventually when the insecurity became prevalent. Uh, it came out in his concerns, it came out in arguments because um, he would always scold me about what I wear. He didn't like that I had a very big social life, especially that I had a lot of guy friends. Um, he didn't like how I dressed uh, and our differences became very obvious when I chose to continue my education and I was very goal-driven, whereas he didn't really care for that. And that became a problem for us because um, I wanted a career and he wanted me to stay home. He preferred something simpler. He preferred it if I was simpler. And at the age of like 19, you don't realize how bad that is. You don't realize how that is going to be a very difficult thing to maneuver. You just think that, okay, I'm in love. So I'm in love. We'll figure this out. You know, love will fix everything. And so, <clears throat> sorry. So when we chose to, okay, so we start dating about seven, eight months before I moved abroad. So I lived in the UK, we were long distance for quite a while. And I think when you go through a long distance relationship, if any of you guys are in one, it definitely tests your, your security with yourself. You have to really trust yourself and you really have to trust your partner. And that was difficult when his insecurities got the best of him. I was always being questioned. We always, we didn't fight as much, but when we did fight, it got really heated. He was someone that could get really, really angry. and the fights would be about very small things, like um, basically my social life, my friends, if I, if I wanted to go out, I would have to ask him first. Um, it would be about um, the, way, the way I behave or act in front of people. It would always be about just things that are not normal. And the number one thing you would fight about, and I don't know if this happens in normal relationships, but this definitely happened in mine. He would always bring up who I was in the past, as in, who did I date before him? Who did I like before him? He would always ask me all these questions and I could tell he was a very insecure person. And the difference between how I am now and how I was then is that I internalized it then. I thought it was my job to make it easier for him. It was my job to create a safer environment in our relationship for him to not be insecure. Me now, I understand that it's not my business. It's not my obligation. If someone's insecure, you run. You know, you let them fix themselves. You let them grow and heal on their own. It's a personal work. You cannot be responsible for another person's well-being, at least in, you know, in a relationship sense. But eventually, as we would argue here and there, I think months later, I only recognized like, wow, he's very comfortable yelling at me. He's very comfortable raising his voice. He's very comfortable cursing at me. He would call me names. He would call me slurs. He would 
insinuate that I was unfaithful. He would accuse me of all these vulgar things and make me feel like a really bad person. He would put me down and make me question, you know, how smart I was. He would make me question how beautiful I was. He would make me question everything in my life. And eventually my friends dropped like flies. I cut off every friendship I had. I cut off any relationship outside him. He didn't like that I had a life outside of him. Eventually, anytime I had a work opportunity, I had to decline it because he wasn't comfortable with me working with men. So that became difficult <laughs> in my line of work because when I was young, I, would, I was working in a company as a communication executive. And that meant I worked under a lot of old men. And old men are old men. You know, they're, they're, they like to see pretty girls. So I obviously had to be a pretty girl and when it came to work. And he didn't like that. He didn't like that people stared at me. He didn't like it when I walked into a room. If a guy looked at me a certain way, it would be my fault. So when we had... I think the first time he ever hit me, I still remember it. It was, it was about a very small argument and he just slapped me out of nowhere. I didn't see it coming. And it was, it, I was shocked, but I didn't realize how bad of a thing it was to hit someone. I didn't think it was, I think it was just like the heat of the moment. I think it was probably because I was making it difficult for him to talk to me. Um, and he apologized immediately. So I just didn't think it was that big of a deal until later on you learn that they will stop apologizing the apologies the stories will stop but the hits won't they will keep hitting you and in in the long run I'm not going to get into the details I'm not going to like show you guys pictures you I feel like you guys have seen enough of what violence looks like but it got to the point where you know I would fear for my own life in the beginning it wasn't too bad it wasn't too hard but I also knew it was wrong but towards the end, after a few times of me trying to maybe work it outside the relationship in the sense that I wanted to leave and really deal with it without being in the relationship, every, basically every time I tried to leave and I came back, it got worse. And we were in a relationship for about three years. So I was in this for three years, and two to three years. Okay, it was almost three. So by the time it was the end and when I chose to end it, it got to a point that he was so violent that I would, I would suffer real injuries. And back then I wouldn't, even though he was physically abusive or even psychologically abusive, which I say is the worst, there wasn't too bad of injuries. I was still able to function. But towards the end, it came to a point where I would jump out of a car because it felt safer to be outside of a car than in a, in a, in a moving car, you know? And if I was to be completely honest, woman to woman, bro to bro, most abusive relationships have the nature of infidelity. There are a lot of lies that happen in an abusive relationship because they're very insecure. So when we were dating for three years, it was on and, on and off. In between those three years, he, there were other girls in the picture. And when I chose to leave, it wasn't even about abuse. I'm going to be completely honest. I didn't leave for the abuse. I left because um, I got tired of catching him, you know, being uh, unfaithful and... I didn't want to project this idea that it was easy for me to leave. I didn't want to project the image that you stop loving the person you're with just because they hit you because that's not the case. I stayed through it because I wasn't willing to lose someone that I love so much. And you, I don't know about all victims of abuse, but a lot of victims of abuse remain in love with their abuser or perpetrator even after the relationship ends. And I think I'll get into this later on, but what I was trying to get through is that when you choose to leave, it isn't an easy decision. It is something you've, you've tried probably multiple times in a normal abusive relationship. It's seven times minimum, is it? Or like an estimated seven times on average, they try to leave and they still come back. And I did that. I came back maybe like 20 times, let's be honest. But when I came back, I didn't come back because he asked me to come back. I didn't come back because he begged me to come back. I came back because I wanted to come back because I wasn't ready to let it go. And when victims of abuse when I see them wanting to exit the relationship they think that they're supposed to be angry they're supposed to be hateful they're supposed to know that this is wrong and they're supposed to like very be strong-minded that they know that they're that this is someone that they don't love anymore but that's not true I think any victim of abuse has been here has understood that even when you leave chances are you're still attached to them you know you I don't think it's fair to beat yourself up when you're trying to leave and you're having a hard time leaving because all of, us has, all of us have been there where we have loved someone too much to the point that we don't love ourselves anymore. 
And when I chose to walk away, it was just me understanding that I had to prioritize my safety, my well-being, and I should allow myself to have the highest quality of life, regardless of whether or not I love this person. So I'd rather love this person from far and reach myself, reach my fullest potential myself, than be in a relationship that diminished me to not even a percentage of what I could do. So that's how I left. And carrying on to the next slide. Um, the team for, uh, I think the charter asked me to speak a bit about this. And this was very interesting for me when they brought this up because I think as someone who's been through it or even people who aren't in it, they always ask why, why does this happen? Or why would you stay? And personally, I can't even tell you guys how many therapist offices, psychologist offices, psychiatrist offices I entered in. And the first question is, okay, I walk inside. I'm like, okay, okay, doc, tell me, why'd he do it? Doesn't he love me? Then why did he do it? Why me? And every single time, the answer would always be power and control. It might come off a, a bit differently, different explanations, different times, but ultimately the root cause is always power and control. And I used to always think that the reason he hit me was because he didn't have control. I thought that his temper would get the best of him. I, I used to always describe it as him seeing red. And when he sees red, he can't see me. And that's, it's not true because eventually I learned, even though I didn't want to believe it, that abuse is a conscious decision. When you, when you do hit someone, it's because you choose to do it. It's never because you're unaware, they're sober. They're, it's a calculative and a conscious decision made. And it's not, as it says here, it's not so much a loss of control, but it's about gaining total control. And a lot of times these perpetrators, they do not view themselves as the bad guy. They always see themselves as the victim and they live in a state of denial too. If you think victims of abuse live in a state of denial, they live in an even more intensely state of state of denial. They don't, be, they don't really see real life as real life. They build fake characters around themselves and they believe that's who they are and they believe that they're the victim to all of this. And it's tough when you see that because they're very sweet people to the public. So in front of other people, they're very kind, they're very nurturing, they're very loving, very affectionate. So when people ask you about the violence that you experienced, they're not going to believe you. They have a hard time believing you because they see this person is really kind, really soft. And then you're describing them to be someone who is so vicious and evil that it just, a lot of times I would say in victim blaming, they don't believe the victim because of this, because they're so charming in nature that you would never believe they would be as, they would never be the bad guy, you know? The second thing is cultural and social norms. This comes up in a lot of like, research that I have done and even when I was putting together the project for the women's shelter you know the lady would always explain to me that this was not to say caused but it definitely has been um, influenced and encouraged by the society that we live in it's it's become very normal when a man believes that a woman is subordinate to them the word that was constantly used in my relationship that I don't realize was awful was the word obedient he would always say he wanted a girlfriend that was obedient. It made life easy for him. And when you think about it, people use the word obedient to describe their dogs. You don't describe your girlfriend as obedient, you know? So when, I don't know if you guys also know this word like kong kong. I don't know if it's a normal thing to say, but you know, when a boyfriend wants you to behave, they kong kong you, they, they kind of control you. And I didn't like that. I was very, I was, I was very much someone who, loved having all these options and I wanted to believe that the sky was the limit for myself I wanted to dream big and he didn't like that he wanted me to be simpler and young me being young and naive and in my first relationship I thought that I, I was I was the problem when you're not okay you're entitled to allow yourself to do whatever you want in life because this is your only life so you have to do what is good for you anyway last point is an important is, a, is an important point because I think it gets misconstrued a lot is a psychological factor in violence. A lot of times, if you were to ask me why violence happens, is because abusers. I never want to say that they're bad people. I want I don't ever want to say that they're evil people because I think that every person has a, has a heart in them. Everybody is a good person at heart, but a lot of them deal with psychological issues. A lot of them are sick in their own nature and they need help sometimes as I've, I've said it so many times but sometimes the people that hurt us the most need help the most they're the ones who need help and 
a lot of abusers probably have been abused in their life before. Um, a lot of them have difficult childhoods and when they go up, they repeat the cycle of violence. They think that's normal. They think they also want to, this time around, want to be the one in power. They want to be the one in control. So that's why they start exhibiting that, that uh, habits, those traits. And I, I used to think that he wasn't well and it was, it was something that was out of his control and that I needed to do my best to help him heal. It was, it was something that I should have been able to fix. But when you really understand the complexities of how an abusive mind works, first of all, it is a conscious decision. And second of all, um, domestic violence and psychological issues, mental issues are two separate entities. You can be sick and it might influence the way that you decide things or you choose things, but you don't like no psychological or mental issue can tell you to hit someone. It is ultimately a decision made with a conscious brain um, and illness. There is no illness that, that, that says you are uncontrollable to the decision to not hit someone. So next slide. How to seek help. Okay, so this was also brought up to me. Uh, I watched an interview that I did recently and I wasn't happy with the fact that I didn't speak from a vulnerable place when it came to this question. Because this is the hardest part, okay? I'm gonna be real. This, the hard part isn't even just being beat up. It isn't even just being controlled or manipulated. It's when you wanna leave. And a lot of times the after effects of a violent relationship of a psychologically um, tormented relationship is what happens after in the healing process. And so now I wanna be honest with this one. With number one, I, I said it's not easy for anyone who's been here. It's, it's important for me to continue, continuously exaggerate. I mean, like, uh, how do I say, express that? Because I think when I was going through it, there wasn't really anybody who was speaking up about this. There wasn't really anyone who showed me that it was possible for me to move on from this. I thought I was, I'm gonna start, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, but like when I was in it, I didn't think that I was able to move past it. Like I thought this would live with me for the rest of my life. And like, I thought that I was, I was, how do I say it? I was difficult because I was still in love with this person. Even when I chose to end it, even when I moved on, I still cared so much about this person. So there is something inherently wrong with me, I used to think. And it's not, you know? And I want anyone who's in this to know that you loving someone only shows the kind of person that you are. It shows the kind of heart that you carry that even someone who's done you so much wrong can, can be so good in your eyes still, in your eyes still. And ultimately it's hard now but it will get better and I would say, give it a couple months, you know, it'll get better at the future. I think that even though I didn't understand it then, I didn't understand how good things could get. I always believed that there was gonna be a point where it would all make sense. Like all these lessons that I learned, is, it was gonna make sense. Um, two, the most important thing for a victim or anyone who experiences this to know is that there is two separate things, there's two separate, um, how do I say? point of views that you have in your life and it's because of all the manipulation so you're constantly doubting what you know you're constantly doubting what you see so you have to stop doing that and basically accept reality for what it is you know that person is abusive you're in an abusive relationship even if there is love that is not love and the first step of I think it's like the grieving process the first step of that is to accept the problem and that is the first step in this process too and then make a plan I would highly recommend uh, reaching out to Awam, which is, um, I don't know what to, how to describe them, but they also have a hotline that you can call. They offer legal advice. They offer counseling as well, psychological counseling. And they will also, they will take care of you to the point that they would go to the police with you to file a report. And I think they would really help in actually making a proper plan because I understand that violent relationships, there are some that are even more intertwined because they're married, they have kids. There are a lot of things and like legal aspects that you have to consider when it comes to relationships that are so entangled. Um, and the third one is for friends and family, for anyone who does know someone who's going through this, who does know anyone who is in that situation and you don't know how to help them. The trick is to just be really, really patient because if you're hard with them or you are aggressive with them, they will run back to the abuser because that's where they feel the safest. So I would say that I was really lucky when it came to this situation because I, I did lose a lot of friendships, but the ones that 
persevered and st stuck by me and loved me unconditionally, I was able to really grow and build myself back up because of these people. And I owe it so much to them. So I think that anyone who has someone who's going through it, I would say be patient, advise them, just don't force them. And finally, seek psychological assistance because I didn't think that there were gonna be psychological effects to what happened to me until it started affecting my life. And I would wish that I would have known better. So I would not have waited till my life was falling apart to actually get help. A lot of victims of abuse will suffer different kinds of uh, mental illnesses after. Uh, but most often it's PTSD, it's, it's anxiety, it's depression. But I would say going to get treated, seeking the help that you need will not only assist you in the healing process, but it will also make you a better person. So that's that. I think the next slide is about questions. Okay, so I think we have one question here. Uh, from Adina Shuhada. Do you think that modern beauty standards for women played a role in why some women experience violence? If yes, what's the best advice you can give to all the beautiful women out there who are insecure with themselves? Okay, so I understand your question in a, in a different way in the sense that I guess if you are insecure, okay, which all of us are, okay, we have it in us, everybody's a little bit insecure, but I do think there is a huge relation between abuse and your self-esteem and, and your self-worth. And with modern beauty standards, which first of all is ridiculous, there's no way you can set up a bar and only one person reaching it. I think everyone is beautiful in their own way. But having that constantly, what's it called? Being hovered around you, I think as women, we always see it left and right everywhere we go. It affects the way that you view yourself. And then ultimately, when someone who has an abusive, who comes from an abusive nature, they see that they hover over, they like, they cling onto that. So they find your weakness, which if you have low self-esteem, that is the, what they crave the most, then they will attack you on that, on that basis. They will make you feel ugly. They will make you feel small and they'll make you feel really, I can't swear, but like really terrible about yourself that you think, okay, damn, I deserve this. I deserve to get beat up. I deserve to be treated like this because I, I'm not beautiful enough. I'm not good enough. You know, it, it goes all the way into the psychological abuse law. But yes, I definitely do think that there is a huge point there, which is why I say anybody out there, you have to love yourself before you ever get into a relationship because then you determine what is okay for you, what is right for you and what is wrong for you. If you don't love yourself enough, you let a lot of bad people take advantage of you because you think you deserve it. Okay, thank you. That, that was such a clear answer. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> so, okay, so we have another question. Uh, I guess both of the speakers could answer this if anyone wants to answer. Uh -huh. uh, from Ahmad Azri Nur Azman, how do we approach people who think that women should be subordinated? What are some of the ways to break the cycle of idea that men are inherently better than women? Because some people stick to that idea and it, it might be tough to get rid of their minds. Thank you. Ms. Nadia can go first. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you would like to after, add? After Miss Sherry had shared her story, everyone was so like, Dr. Nadia. Okay. <laughs> okay, fine. That's, uh, okay, the, the question was so is interesting, actually. Yeah. Because it's all about mindset and how we are, how we were brought up. Eh? It, an issue. I mean, what Miss Sherry actually shared also, I think... It's normal tau actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Being a set that I'm much more older than you guys lah. Kan? I've been there. Okay. <laughs> okay. But the, the thing is, it happens because our society, especially Malays, eh? Malays eh? Mm -hmm. I'm not putting up macam some racism ke apa ni, eh? but it's <laughs> a normal practice ni. I, I memang um, being a reality, memang reality lah ni. Eh? Malay especially, they like to put uh, men as superior, especially when they put religion as uh, their backbone. Mm. Yeah. The reason of it is, eh, 
lelaki kan um, pemimpin umah lah kan pemimpin umah lah apa lah dah EPU sekiadah gitu kan ha, kan dia kena ketubuhan menurut tu <laughs> that one is another story tapi itu yang I want to show you that from the start eh, from the start kiranya um, if you have uh, siblings kan siblings uh, uh, boy, boys lah boys and girls kan um, you boleh nampak how they they treated you very differently Okay, yes. I'm not saying all lah, but perhaps uh, most most of the families are doing this. Okay, men's, tak payah bayar, tak payah basuh pinggan. It's a woman's job. Tak payah jemur baju, no, you cannot. Tak payah, that's not jantan for you. Okay, you go play football. You go play games. You go play, uh, you know, baca surat khabar sebab you yang akan menukar keadaan dunia ni bukan perempuan. Macam, yes. you, <laughs> something like that. Where it becomes a culture. Hmm. Well, kita tak rasa benda tu pelik tau We don't feel it as offensive pun For us As girls, especially all of you In this age And my age also <laughs> And we find it It's not disturbing pun We find it Oh betul lah kan Memanglah We, we cannot say boys Kena buat kerja dapur Mestilah girls Nanti uh, isteri kena Kena masak untuk suami Which Now I think it's Ridiculous sebab I pun suruh je kadang-kadang I malah macam Bang masak lah bang <laughs> it's, it's actually my husband would actually Gladly pun kadang-kadang kadang dia pun macam bosan lah Asyik lah lah begini aku Macam faham tak? Macam eh tu in, in a fun way lah kan So ni this one what, what the question tu is a very serious issue tau For hmm. me lah We cannot change it now bila dia dah besar It's very hard lah. I'm perhaps they are macam kadang-kadang macam uh, if you are married kan. Nanti if you, are, you guys are married jangan kawin sekarang sabar eh. Sabar <laughs> dulu, dulu. Sabar bertenang eh. Uh, kawal apa pun yang dirasa tu kawal. Okay. When you get married later eh. Um, you will find the first five years of marriage to very um, stressful tau. <laughs> Because you know why? You are taking over his mother's job tau. <laughs> Something like okay. Bila you Yelah, bila you boyfriend and girlfriend, everything pun nice kan. You pergi keluar, pakai cantik-cantik, wangi-wangi kan. Pergi keluar, jalan-jalan, balik. You balik rumah you, dia balik rumah dia. You pun tak tahu lepas tu dia campak jeans dia dekat tengah-tengah uh, ruang tamu ke. Or you know like, just buka tengah-tengah rumah. And then just, you know, you know uh, because he's a guy, he doesn't care. Okay, you don't know his true colors until he's married to you. I'm not saying it's my husband, okay, <laughs> just, just generally, but it's it's something that you have to go through though, because I'm not, I, I cannot say that you can change your mindset fortnightly ke, ataupun throughout your marriage pun, ada orang sampai dah, dah ke hujung nyawa pun, ya Allah laki aku sama je perangai, <laughs> ya Allah sama je perangai, but what I'm trying to say here, my point is, It's a question of how we are brought up. Okay? Mm. Not saying that your parents did wrong. Tak. The parents of parents may be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no. But someone is wrong when they actually stigmatize. Eh? When, when last year kan kita ada cakap pasal uh, this UNYC juga talk. But we talk about uh, gender discrimination. That's where I realize this starts with gender discrimination. Violence against women is so closely related to gender discrimination. When Miss Sherry actually shared her story kan, about uh, about her uh, her experience, it's actually true tau. Because men actually normally, they want to, they want to, they want to feel they are powerful. They have control. They want to, they, they want to do that. It is just the way they live. Because they say, if you don't want to dengar kata, or cakap dengar tak, you know, like, tak nak dengar kata, then don't, you don't have to be with me. I want to be with someone with, um, dengar kata lah, how you should wear, how you should do your hair, how you should work on your tudung, how you should you, you know, men are like that. To overcome this is to educate at home. Itu very beginning lah, okay. Living in the society now, okay. I have to be honest eh, society now is very challenging. Very, very challenging eh. Especially for you guys lah. I lah lepas sikit lah. Lepas sikit daripada umur you guys ni. <laughs> okay. But you, as an early 20s eh. Early 20s, I believe everyone is early 20s now. Early 20s ni, is facing so much challenge that I did not face 
during my time. During my time when I was early 20s tu, I did not face whatever you are facing especially macam uh, ada social media pun boleh kena depression. I did not face that. But you guys are facing it now. Which I believe the level of community now is very very high as a challenge to a living now. So, kalau you nak change kan a person tu, it start back at home. Okay, no matter lah how how um, uh, modern our life is, but if it's from home saying that this is how the way you treat a woman, this is how you uh, even uh, maybe a father treats his or her mother, he is looking at the um, example of his father treating her mother or, or, or whatever ways they are. Perhaps it doesn't happen. But I I doubt so also because <laughs> some people, their parents are so loving, eh? so loving, so wonderful, so beautiful. But when it comes to themselves, it's another story. So to give you a solution, how to handle, perhaps Miss Sherry has shared how to reach out. But to change a person's behavior is definitely back to how you were brought up. That, that is my my point of view. Okay. Perhaps Miss Sherry have another point of view. No, some, it's about the same. It's, it's, I think it's also about raising boys and girls the same. And I think when it comes to Malaysia, I think raising the level of education or like quality of education to not just being about maths and science, but also about um, mor- morality, about being kind to people. I think we don't really have classes about that in, in, in the, I was in IB. So we had this like one class where it was about critical thinking and we would be put in positions where we would ask, how would you react to certain things? We would learn about, um, I, what was this called? Uh, I forgot what it was called, but you know, you, they ask you about all these tough choices that you are gonna actually face in life. And then it teaches you to, to become more aware of that, of how the real world actually is. And I feel like if everyone in the community encourages this conversation and actually acknowledges violence as a bad thing, you know, actually acknowledge as a bad thing, I think abusers, will not, they'll get scared to do it also, right? And like, I think holding right. them accountable, yeah, I, I think holding them accountable, I think because of all the victim blaming, I don't know how it's like uh, within like the olden days, but I feel like last time it would be really tough for any woman in an abusive relationship to come up because people look down on divorce. People look down on uh, women who, who you know, talk a lot of smack about their husband when it's actually there. They are the victims. So when you blame victims, you deflect the uh, accountability from a, an abusive person. So the abusive person will continuously think they're the victim. So I think it's all about education as well. Okay, so I guess both speakers have shared their point of views about the question by Ahmad Azri. We have a lot of questions actually, (laughs) seriously. Uh, Maybe one more question because we're running out of time. Uh, Okay, from Ilyan, from Farha Nabila, I feel so helpless and frustrated when women are blamed for speaking out. How do we handle these narrow-minded people? I'll just start first because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> give all women. Okay, um, I face this a lot actually. Um, during my um, school days, my um, FUU days, okay, <laughs> all people say that, banyak cakap lah dia ni, you know, and then when they know that I'm a law student, patutlah law student, <laughs> patutlah dia ni lawyer punya. I face that a lot. Even even now, they're not brani lah kan, sebab Dr. Nadia kan. So, tak brani lah sikit. <laughs> I know. But I face that a lot actually. Um, Even sometimes, it's from the relatives pun. You know, something like they say like, Ish, perempuan ni, jangan lah banyak cakap sangat. Mm. Things like that. We get that a lot. I mean, I get that a lot. Because I'm the one, kalau dalam meeting pun, I cakap macam I, I memang macam, tapi kan, uh, you know, like I, I always argue stuff, not because I'm a law student, ataupun I was a lawyer, ataupun I'm a law lecturer, but I, I, I memang kalau salah tu, I point out, I memang jenis, it's me, I think most of us, most of the girls, bila kita voice out our concerns, we always say that kaki baby. you know, kita always get that kan, macam, ih, baby je dia ni, macam, you know, but when we try to prove ourselves, normally we have to do it one step ahead from guys. 
eh bila kita nak prove ourselves tau bukan kita complain ke apa but when it comes to our proof ourselves eh um give me as example lah okay i get my phd before i was 30 years old okay i was looked down eh because i was young and i got I PhD mula look down kan? <laughs> orang tak ada PhD lagi lah orang look down kan? I got PhD and people look down on me because I was a a, a, a young woman and then um, I was young and age lah. Okay, young, woman and young and age. Okay. So, whenever I voice out eh, whenever I voice out my concerns or my standing or, or, or whatever I think lah. Okay. I always Um, they always cut me down lah. They always cut off lah. They say that, um, oh okay, uh, macam you know like, alah budak muda kan cakap kan. So macam perempuan pula tu, macam you know, yes, tak apalah, not that important. Always, always get that. And what I did was, I proved myself to them until they cannot say anything to lawan me back. How I do it. I memang prove myself by work. I work so bad. Sampai bukanlah bad as in macam mati ke apa. No lah. I work really hard to prove myself. And I can say lah. Bukan nak belagak. Okay. But I can share with all of you. For those who know, who knows. I have proved myself up until I am recognized. Um, my writings are recognized at the international level. Okay. US people started to say that my writings are excellent. I just uh, received one comment from an editor yesterday from an ASEAN uh, uh, from an ASEAN level, eh, ASEAN level saying that my articles can be turned into a uh, regional policy. You see how I I see how people look down because I'm just a young woman, okay? And I have to prove myself from the from the moment I got my PhD. Just to share, people for for people students also like, oh, Dr. Nadia, hebatnya dapat PhD. They, they don't know the struggle, you know. The struggle I'm facing because I have to face these old professors that uh, considered not all at, maybe all at age lah, but all at um, uh, experience also. So they have so many experience as compared to me. So people don't look at me that much, you know. I have to step up a bit, okay? I have to work triple hard until I, I, they don't have any bullets, you know, against me. They cannot because, okay, this area, she's performing well. This area, she's performing well. This area also well. I cannot. Everywhere also cannot. So, I actually shut them off because the fact that they want to shut me, shut me down because saying that, ala banyak cakap dia ni. But the fact that I actually prove them wrong, saying that, hey, I'm a young woman and I can do it, not because I am, you know, holding a professor's leg ke, saying that, okay, this old professor is uh, is bringing me. No, I'm doing it on my own. So, bila I prove myself, then people start to realize, oh, okay. Okay lah, dia ni tak boleh sentuh lah, dia ni. Ya, dia ni, I cannot lah, cannot. So that's the way. They are that way, which, which I, 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 I think lah, I rasa. Remember eh, especially girls, young girls like you. You guys are so young, okay. Don't waste your years. Eh? Don't waste your years letting people bringing you down. Okay. I've been through eh, Cakap lah apa je. Eh? Lelaki, mana? I cakap je lah. <laughs> you know? I've been through every toxic relationship ke. Okay? Normally tu, uh, sebab I ni jadi cepat bosan. So, selalunya I lah yang toxic tu. So, I pun lah daripada relationship tu. <laughs> so, but it's okay. It saves me anyway. So, I don't care. Can, um, kalau you rasa now eh. Now, now at your level. You rasa it's not gonna go anywhere. Trust me, eh? trust me hard. This one I'm giving a heart to heart, which I tak bagi tahu lah dalam kelas kan. Whatever you're facing now, hold it tight. Hold it so tight and make sure that whatever you want to throw away tu is worth it and you will go one step further without people even going to judge you, going to say anything bad because they cannot. Okay, that's how you prove your worth.
that's how you say, eh, hello, I Dr. Nadia lah. Something like that lah. Bukan nak belagak, contoh. <laughs> I Dr. Nadia. Okay? Bila I Dr. Nadia and people know, oh, Dr. Nadia is this. A woman kena buat macam tu. I can give so many um, excuses eh. Masa I nak buat PhD, some people call tell me directly to my face tau. Eh, tak payahlah buat PhD. Nanti kahwin masa tu I belum kahwin. Nanti kahwin, you duduk dapur kan? Yes, some people banyak, oh even banyak people sebab dia dia looking at me bang, kudul lah dia buat PhD kan. Buat gila-gila macam ni kan. Macam sampai kepala otak tak betul hari apa ni tak tahu lah macam tu kan. So, orang cakap macam tu because they look down on people tau, especially women. Lagi-lagi women, if you see women yang buat PhD with kids kan, lagi dia orang down. Sebab people are saying that, buat apa you buat? You are going to end up at dapur. I think yang ni biasa kan, orang, I think most of you dah dengar dah benda ni. Tak payah, deng- tak payah belajar tinggi-tinggi, nanti balik ke dapur. Apa, memanglah aku pergi dapur, aku lapar. Aku nak makan, semua orang pun pergi, hello. Kan? So, what's the what's the point? But, I just want to stress out. Remember eh, whoever is uh, tadi tanya or whoever lah here are facing difficulties eh, improving yourself eh, proving yourself. At one point, you don't even have to prove yourself eh. Nanti orang akan even know you without introduction pun. Okay, just stay um, stay strong to your heart lah. Memang, memang betul-betul kena strong because woman, remember it's a challenge until the end of time. Until akhirat pun challenge juga. Tapi kita boleh masuk syurga. Eh, tiba. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you Dr. Nadia for the fun and very clear answer to the question just now. We have so many questions but unfortunately it's 9.49. Uh, we are about to end our webinar for today. So, um, okay, yeah. So I guess that marks the end of our webinar today. Each speaker has shared their insights, their sharings, inputs for everyone to bring back as a take-home message. And I, 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 I seriously, I was jotting down a lot of things because both speakers they shared a lot of information that I didn't know, and now I know which is a good thing. Now I know how to help my friends who are facing the same thing, probably, you know, we don't know. So now now that we know the, the new form of violence, everything, uh, like from what both speakers has mentioned. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Your Saturday night now is like, you know, you're spending your Saturday night with us, which is a good thing because you're spending it at home. <laughs> Don't go out, okay? Stay safe, stay home. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's all for today. Uh, and please be reminded that the recorded session will be uh, uploaded in our uh, Facebook account. So if you guys miss, you know, want to rewatch uh, uh, this session again, please go to UNYC UKM's Facebook account. So we'll be re- we'll be posting the video there. So. Okay, thank you everyone. Good.